Good evening. On behalf of NIAS Director, faculty, staff and students, I welcome all of you for the 13th Raja Ramanna Memorial Lecture. We have Dr. Kasturi Rangan with us to deliver this special lecture today. He'll be speaking on the topic, Grand Challenges in Science and Technology, Its Multiple Dimensions. This year, this memorial talk is organized as a part of ongoing NIAS DST training program on science, technology, and society, a multidisciplinary perspective. We are also happy and extend our warm welcome to the family of Raja Ramana who is present here. I request Professor Baldev Raj to speak a few words about NIAS founding director, Dr. Raja Ramana, introduce the speaker and chair the session. Thank you. Good evening to all of you and my gratitude and thanks for joining in this public lecture, 13th Raja Ramana Memorial Lecture, which is being delivered by Dr. K. Kasuri Rangan. This is the 13th Raja Ramana Memorial Lecture. He was the founder director of the National Institute of Advanced Studies. He, along with Dr. Homi Baba and Vikram Sarabhai, for a long time shaped the Department of Atomic Energy. The Department of Atomic Energy without Raja Ramana would have been multi times less as compared to what it is with his contributions, imaginations and motivation. On this very occasion, we always have the pleasure of welcoming Mrs. Malati Ramana, who always joins and she shall join us soon, and the family members of Dr. Raja Ramana. Dr. Raja Ramana, as the director of the NAS, shaped the institute in multidisciplinarity and in a more than what can be expressed in ways and words, he has brought the best of the people to this institute and firmly nurtured the interdisciplinarity. Science, social sciences, psychology, fine arts, philosophy. He himself was very deeply interested and accomplished musician. He played piano as well as he could do the nuclear science or the atomic science or talk about the reactors and the nuclear explosions. His contributions are not only in atomic energy, his contributions have been widely acclaimed in defense. As a member of the Rajya Sabha and also for a short time as a Minister of State for Defense. Very rarely, and you are fortunate as a country and as an organization, when you get a philosopher, musicologist, musician, fine human being, a person who is full of humor and at the same time is profound and has deep learning. Every time we remember him, we very much wish him to be amidst us, but we know that he is always with us and with my personal experience I can say that once you love a person, he never goes away. The nature's law may take the people away at a particular time, but the people who have made contributions to us, the people who have nurtured us, who have mentored us, always stay with us. So Dr. Raja Ramana would stay with Department of Atomic Energy, Defense, the country, and more important to Nyas because he was the founding father. Every time we have a dialogue and debate as to who shall deliver this year's Raja Ramana Memorial Lecture because of all the memorial lectures, you realize this lecture has a very special importance 
for us. Being a founding father and having influenced us most of the time, particularly I was fortunate because I served Department of Atomic Energy for most of the years and then I came to NIAS and both these organizations are in many ways shaped by Dr. Raja Ramana, his vision, his style, his artistic sense and his deep contributions. I don't intend to read the biodata of Dr. Raja Ramana because there are some people for whom the biodata is not the justice. The awards which the country has given to him, even though at the highest level of Padam Vibhushan, that only has brought the dignity and the stature of the award up rather than Dr. Raja Ramana. He was such a person endearing and profound that every award which was to him was more than deserving for him. We have today another iconic person whom I have admired and loved with all my mind, with all my thinking and based on all what I observed in him and he is Dr. Kasuri Rangan who is going to speak to us and to all of us and particularly the participants of this course it is extremely important because you are the ones who are really thinking and delivering on the grand challenges in science and technology. And I know that when we are working in a field we have restricted perspective, we don't get the multi dimensions and we don't even connect the challenges. And many a times these challenges are connected to each other. So he with his all wisdom and experiences has decided to speak on grand challenges in science and technologies, its multiple dimensions. Again, I have not the ability nor the biodata can do justification to Dr. Kasuri Rangan, but I must say that in independent India over more than 60 years, he has shaped Department of Space, he has shaped many a decisions when he was a member of Science and Technology and Planning Commission, currently as a chairman of the National Education Policy and chairman of Karnataka Knowledge Commission, he is all in. His one characteristic is that when he takes any assignment, particularly for the country, he is 100% in it. Not only that, he gets the 100% best from all his colleagues and associates. I have silently admired his ability to take the best from the teams and bringing in the team the best from anywhere. I believe if this aspect is taken as a learning for most of the people who are participating, especially the participants, it would be a paradigm change. You can't realize anything on your own. You cannot even realize everything. After you have formed a team, you have to take the best out of the team and deliver sometime beyond the expectations what you have been, what have been put on you. Space program, current successes are in many ways the continuity of the culture and the science which always mentions, which he learned from his mentors, namely Vikram Sarabhai, Stish Tavan and Yuar Rao and what he improved on and carried on in his journey. He has been honored by the best of the forums, by the academies and by many of the eminent bodies in the domains in which he worked, namely International Academy of Astronautics and he served as a vice president of that society also and he is a member of the International Astronomical Union and so on and so forth. He is the honorary fellow of the Cardiff University UK and the academician of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences Vatican City. All the awards which could come have come to him but I think this is not the end, it is the beginning of the end and he is bound to be recognized and bound to be called upon for many 
realizations which are extremely important he has been awarded honors by the governments of karnataka by government of india by the educational institutes by international bodies and everywhere his honors include padma shri padma bhushan padma vibhushan by the president of india and award of the officer of lyon of honor by the president of french republic france again i would not try to be complete it is just the fragrance of the life of dr kasuri rangan sir we are very fortunate that you have agreed you have delivered many lectures whenever we have requested every time it has been learning every time it has been widening our horizon and motivating us to do more this particular lecture is of much great greater interest to us and that is why much more gratitude to you for accepting to deliver to honor dr raja ramana professor k kasuri rangan डॉक्टर बलदेवराज डायरेक्टर नियास द वेरी डिस्टिंग्विश मेंबर्स ऑफ द डॉक्टर राजा रामना फैमिली अदर डिस्टिंग्विश्ड इनवाइटीज एंड आल्सो द पार्टिसिपेंट्स फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई शुड express my thanks to dr baldev raj for inviting me to deliver this raja ramana memorial lecture and of course it's very difficult to say no to him number 1 and it is also carries the very very respected name of dr raja ramana i accepted it without any kind of a reservation when he said this coming to nias of even though i still continue to be in some association with nias coming to nias is a very unique experience always with its a very diverse kind of activities the freedom and the type of people who work here and the leadership of baldev which has really made a difference uh, to this institute in the recent years he has brought in new ideas new mechanisms new institutional linkages and uh, many other things which has put this in the not only in the map of india but also internationally so we are all very proud to have belonged to this at some time or other and we would like to thank baldev for now taking it further to higher levels something which was started by raja ramanna he is giving the fitting attention to it to take it to much higher levels about raja ramana even though my association has been of a limited nature but i had been in touch with him many number of time many many times since he was the director of bark earlier and later on of course as atomic energy commission chairman and in other roles uh, the first meeting took place in very interesting um, circumstances he was interested in looking at the issues of atmospheric nuclear explosions and uh, he asked uh, professor davan who was then the chairman of isro whether from space we can do something to detect those atmospheric nuclear explosions and uh, of course sadish davan said we can look at it we'll send somebody to discuss with you and if it is workable certainly we will do it for you so he called me one day i was at that time working as one of the senior scientists at the isro satellite center and he told me that uh, why don't you go and meet dr raja ramana you want to have some work done from the department of space regarding detecting the nuclear explosions in atmosphere by some space bound sensor system of course i immediately could guess why this is being asked from us because we have been just thinking at that time to work in the cosmic gamma ray burst it has just been discovered a very interesting phenomenon of a few seconds in which the intensity of cosmic gamma rays the gamma rays that come from outer space typically about 1 to 2 mev each rises up tens of the tens time or maybe sometimes even more and in a very short period and then it comes down it was estimated even at one time 
that at the time in which it just brightens up the sky is from somewhere you don't even know from where it comes from but the sky brightens up at that time the brightening is equivalent to the brightening of a whole galaxy if it blows up so you can see 10 raised to 11 stars that is the kind of a thing so these rays were discovered serendipitously as usual <laughs> in this astronomy but more importantly the magnitude of the explosion, the energetics of the explosion was the one that baffled. And even today one discusses about it. The fact remains that it was somewhere in 1960s and 30-40 years over. But still one discusses, discusses about its possible origins. Because now they think it could be the coalitions of neutron stars. It could be black hole neutron collisions. And many other possibilities. Something which is not very different from what we are trying to ascribe to in terms of the gravitational waves themselves. So this was, I, meant, I went to Atomic Energy Office, Bar, Bark Office, and uh, he directly had made all the arrangements for discuss, starting the discussion. He and Dr. P. K. Iyengar was there, they were the two who were there at that time in the room, and they explained the whole thing of what they are looking for. And of course, one thing was very clear to me that the discovery of this radiation from outer space was the product of a, a, a cosmic, rather a, a, a gamma ray detector, a burst detector that was flown by the U.S. military, primarily to look at the uh, nuclear explosions. So it was quite obvious that the energetics should be right, detectability is there, and anything that can discover a cosmic gamma ray get more than possible that it can detect easily an atmospheric explosion. So that part of it, I did already the homework for all that kind of a thing, what kind of detector, a sodium ionic crystal, a proton multiplier, and the rest of the pulp processing circuitry, things of that kind. So we had a long session. In fact, he started the meeting at 10 o'clock, went up to 1 o'clock, a special lunch we had. And uh, then what is significant to note here is that he was aware of many many details of how to detect it what kind of energetics is what are the time times timings that you need to have what is the size of the detector that can enable it to get high efficiency i was amazed at that particular level of being the bark director and also dr ayengar they both had studied this question so thoroughly and that is where the leadership really matters you know at the at the, at the top at the top level if you can go to that level of details you cannot be taken for a ride. That was very clear. So you have to really be thoroughly prepared. We have to discuss with a person like Dr. Raja Ramana. So that is that left a lasting impression. Of course, later on, there was a lecture in which the main hall of the bark. He took me there, made me sit near him. I was very young, and that was not that uh, senior in Isro. But I think the importance he gave was the other aspect of it. How? humane he was and how humble he was in trying to give me that kind of an importance in front of more than thousand people who had assembled for that particular lecture that day. I still remember that. So then of course many, many, many times we met with respect to either this particular thing we did, wanted to build one, but as for some reason I think we, we did build this kind of detectors, we detected cosmic gamma ray burst, but I don't think we had any incidents in which a radiation burst the one that is exploded from the in the atmosphere was done but the, this was a very interesting beginning of a asso limited association that we had later on of course I used to go and meet him regarding radio isotope requirements for ISRO in, we are building some instruments on the nuclear radiation detection and uh, then we lost uh, contacts for quite some time except that as chairman ISRO he used to come to my office for discussing something very in, some, some of the interesting problems on the experimental side and also and but they were not necessarily nuclear physics he used to talk about hieroglyphics he could talk about uh, archaeology uh, the, his breadth was so wide it was so nice to hear him and spend time with him he used to do that and then finally when I left Isro and uh, Dr. Narasimha offered that I should come and work here. And uh, at that particular time, uh, again, he had just, I think, come and 
uh, yeah, sitting in the office. He was, he was the first director. After that, after he stepped down, Narasimha took over. And after Professor Narasimha took over, and he had his stint as a director here. He invited me, and of course, I had to go through a lot of procedure at that time. I was also um, put as a member of the Rajya Sabha, so I had to go through the Office of Profit requirements. And But anyhow, I got the clearances from the Chairman of the Rajya Sabha. And so I came here. So one of the first things I did was to call on him. He was there in one of those rooms. And uh, very interesting, again, the conversation was more related to how much philosophy I know, how much of archaeology I know, many, many other kind of subjects, something which is more related to this institute. He was not asking me anything, and also how much of Sanskrit I know. So that is the kind of question. It was a fairly good interview that I went through, even though Narasimha had already offered the position. The final clearance had to come from Dr. Raja Ramana. Anyhow, we had a good discussion and uh, there was another time I remember how much this thing is, but he used to be there regularly at the institute if he is in Bangalore. He had a couple of small puppies or something like that. They used to be also there sitting nearby. Um, it was a wonderful thing that you, you are sitting somewhere in a couple of rooms in, near to him. And wow, you can walk in any time, you can discuss anything, and he is always there ready to share his own thoughts on the subject. So that is the person whom I know as Dr. Raja Raman. Of course, I couldn't believe once we heard that he is no more one of the days. Is. But I think we remember so vividly the way he made this place lively even after his retirement that I don't think that we need to really think that he is no more with us. I think what is more important is to carry forward his legacy. Now, keeping all this in mind, of course, this lecture, therefore, is a matter of a great prestige and pride for me to accept. But most importantly, I had to really de decide what to talk about. So I was also checking with Dr. Baldevra. I had thought that I would talk a little bit about the massive investment that India is making, running into billions into astronomy. Things about six or seven of those experiments, the huge experiments in which India is going to be a partner and also going to ourselves. So thinking of that kind of a thing, I thought I should come and deliver something because that, that is again, Bach is involved, atomic energy is involved and there is some kind of a legacy, TIFR is involved and there are some part of DST and other institutions and some of the things are from ISRO too. So I thought it would be a very nice thing to, it's a kind of a tribute to Dr. Radharam, but then when I discussed with Baldev, he said he would like to hear something on the type of book that we were editing together jointly on the grand challenges in science and technology. We started about three years back when I was offered the INE professorship and uh, it was because of him so I should certainly respect his views on this and uh, so we had a discussion and he said why don't we talk something about the type of articles we are collect collect collecting together some by GMN and others and on ch grand challenges in science and technology. And uh, a few of them, anyhow, we can't talk about eight or nine of them that is there. But uh, we thought at least a few of them to give a sample of the type of article that are being contributed. And uh, it, they were interesting because they provided a new perspective to carrying out the grand challenges in science and technology. So I thought, okay, that, uh, that is another way to choose a topic. Uh, I also had a discussion with the present president of the INAE, Dr. B. M. Suresh, and also Dr. Goyal, who is here. So it was a fairly intense discussion of what I should be doing. And finally, it's a part of, uh, we decided that this, we will pick up a few challenges, the, cha the topics I will come to now, uh, which I can just do a little mention of it, because there is no time for elaboration. Each one of them can be a five-hour lecture, so it does, just doesn't make a sense. But just to give a flavor of the way we are thinking and the type of subjects we have chosen and how it is shaping, that, that is all that I can be able to give in the short time available uh, about this particular thing. But that's what they, they felt that I should do. Of course, both Baldev and Professor S. Chandrasekhar of Niyas, they will also be working, we will be working together in this uh, particular effort. And I use this opportunity, of course, to thank uh, Professor Baldevra, Baldev Dr. B. M. Suresh, as well as Dr. Goyal for their tremendous support 
in initiating this activity and asking me to uh, take up this job. Just to give you a little background of how we went about it, because this is not something on which we just sit down, put, put down some thoughts and be done with that. We thought we ought to really do something of the type of thing that we want to. We want to. Uh, we do see that there have been a lot of write-ups, uh, road maps were on science and technology endeavors. There is these inputs, of course, provided influential. They were very influential in crafting strategies and defining plans. Besides providing critical inputs for think tank agencies in the related effort to develop appropriate short, medium, and long-term perspectives. In fact, that too even now jibes with the present government's idea of a three-year kind of a term, a seven-year and a fifteen-year kind of a thing. So you have this kind of a short, medium, and long-term perspectives on which many things have been analyzed and written. In the context of important initiative that the present government has announced, it felt to bring a proper focus to the earlier directions and effort. That's what we thought coming to some of the key areas, including coming out with a goal-oriented action plan. Such a step could drive major efforts in science and technology leading to significant impacts on the overall development of the country and also its economic growth. So what is the process that we adopted for doing this? In the process of attempting such an exercise, the first thing that we did was to invite some suggestions. We wrote to several key people in this country who has have occupied their top intellectuals in science and technology planners, policy makers. We told them that why don't you give us some idea of what these grand challenges this country needs at this particular juncture and how are you going to deal with this. So the response was really overwhelming. Most of the scientists wrote to me back saying that these are the areas you should put down. I am not going to go into the details of those areas, but several of those scientists and they wrote several ideas. So there was enough choices to be made, discussed and choices to be made. The response to this implant, that is why I said it is overwhelming. And they were very thoughtful ideas regarding the choice of topics. Finally, eight such grand challenges were shortlisted based on the scale of importance for the country in terms of their social relevance, their role in the wealth creation, commercialization and strategic capabilities. The choice of grand challenges besides being based on the scale of the challenge also takes due cognizance of the diversity of solutions they offer since there is no one size fits all when it comes to dealing with grand challenges of this scale. Each topic will briefly outline the challenge in the Indian context, outline the current status and then provide a comprehensive set of solutions. So that is the kind of a framework we laid down and the process that we adopted. So what is the kind of things that we finally came to? First and foremost, having gone through this exercise, having had a final shortlisting that was done with the three of the past presidents and myself, four of us, and then having shortlisted this eight talk, so we had to also make sure that we have the right type of authors. And so we had to really contact the best of the people available in the country and that they agree to write this because they have to also spend time in writing this. But luckily, these eight, the eight, eight topics we had, in fact, I should say only one had a difficulty with respect to the other and that was on vaccines. And the particular author is a very, very accomplished author. Unfortunately, he said he will not be available for the next one year. So we had to change it. But we got an equally interesting theme for that which I will mention about it just now. So the first one that I would like to say is about the science of water, a new paradigm for 21st century, which is now contributed by Dr. Mihir Shah. Mihi, Dr. Mihir Shah, I may mention, has been a member of the planning commission and he was in charge of the entire water plan, plan, policy planning. And he brought so much of science into it, so much of approach of methodologies into it, uh, that the present government has also appointed him for the water resources planning in this country. So you can see he is one of the finest person who understands uh, the water related issues in this country. He agreed to do that and he has contributed a very, very interesting article on bringing science to back to water, a new paradigm for the century. The second one was on machine intelligence and its relevance to India. Uh, even though I know many people in the machine intelligence, I thought I should request Professor Vidya Sagar. He is not here most of the time, but then wherever he is in, we decided that we should contact him. We should get him and we could get him to contribute. He is in Texas. He spent some time in Hyderabad, but we made him come and write an article. And he has contributed an article on the machine intelligence and its relevance to India. 
advanced materials of course i didn't find anything anybody better than dr baldev raj himself and he and dr sundar at the indira gandhi kalpakam they said uh, they, they said that they will write this and they have already completed and they have submitted this india's transition to cleaner energy system we have a very fine scientist here dr dilip ahuja who has been working uh, since the early years he has been working quite a bit on energy systems climate climate change and he has been also a part of the 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 un um, the, the the un study on the climate change so he had contributed chapters in this so he agreed and they have written something along with one of his co colleague dr shoibal who is a phd from princeton a younger boy but between them they have written a very interesting article on the india's transition to cleaner energy system deep ocean technologies of course we had limited choices in this country nuclear majority but then we caught hold of three of the leaders who really brought up the national institute of ocean technology in chennai and uh, atmanand dr abindran and dr ramdas and they agreed and they have contributed this article an interesting article on deep ocean technology which is just taking up climate change and food security i thought we should bring two modern scientists one from agriculture and one from the climate change professor sk satish the professor and who is now the director of the dvhr center for climate change at the indian institute of science and uh, professor himanshu patak at that time was the deputy director general of the indian council of agriculture research and now he has taken over the regional center i think somewhere in the east part east part of india on the agriculture related planning they agreed to write together uh, they have written the second draft of it we are now trying to work through this to finalize modernizing indian traditional systems of medicine by professor darshan changar and professor bhushan patwardhan it was an interesting i told you that i tried to contact the science the very well known scientists in vaccine development in this country it has been one of the major accomplishments in this country in the science and technology but he had to withdraw suddenly and so we contacted we thought that we will change the topic and modernizing in indian traditional systems of medicine and uh, they gladly professor bhushan sakwardhan who is now the vice chancellor of the transdisciplinary university in bangalore and professor bhushan patwardhan who was earlier the vice chancellor of the pune university both are exceptional you know, familiar with the biotechnology and, and the traditional systems of medicine and so on so they agreed and they have written a very very thoughtful and beautiful, beautiful article engineering education innovation and research professor bhati pradeep datta a professor at the indian institute of science he has a lot of experience in this area of education and particularly in the area of engineering and technology he agreed and he has also completed his task so it's interesting that uh, most of these people came forward to write it and what i do now for the rest of the time available to me is to choose two or three of these topics and just quickly go through the type of flavor they are given to their article and their writing i will talk about the bringing of science back to water of dr mihir shah machine intelligence and its relevance to india professor vidyasagar then dog deep ocean technologies atmanand ravindran and this and lastly modernizing indian traditional systems of medicine professor darshan shankar so these are the four topics i will touch on in the next uh, few minutes that is available to me bringing the science back to water a new paradigm for the 21st century india faces all of us know a major crisis of water as we move into the 21st century this crisis threatens the basic right of drinking water of our citizens it also puts the livelihoods of millions at risk demands of a rapidly industrializing economy and urbanizing society come to at a time when the potential for augmenting supply is limited water tables are falling and water quality issues are increasingly come to the fore climate change poses fresh challenges with its impact on the hydrological cycle life use water use efficiency in agriculture which consumes around 80% of our water resources continues to be among the lowest in the world at 25 to 35% this compares poorly with 40 to 45% water use and efficiency in malaysia and morocco and 50 to 60% efficiency in israel japan china and uh, taiwan india's approach to water for decades after independence this is the most important observation after the analysis that uh, professor mehir shah did uh, uh, was based on an attempt to command and control rivers endlessly extract ground water ignore watershed health and river ecosystems in recent decades 
Some changes have become visible with greater emphasis on the watershed management and even more recently a concern for ecological flows in rivers and aquifer management. Ecological flows in rivers were never considered dams or just built and uh, we did never know, nobody worried whether there is water downstream or not. Both these changes are still in their infancy. For these changes to become truly meaningful and effective at scale requires bringing the science back to water. So this chapter has outlined the multiple dimensions of what this change would entail. Quite apart from civil engineering and hydrology, this is what everybody does with respect to dealing with water and managing it. The author argues that a real understanding of water and sustainable and equitable management requires harnessing of insights from hydrology, hydrogeology, soil, soil science, agronomy, economics, ecology, sociology, anthropology, public policy, law and management. So any kind of discipline that one is familiar with, I think water comes into picture. There is no question on this. So any analysis that you want to do with is scientifically rigorous and pragmatically leads to conclusions. You need to bring in these dimensions of a water management system. In which specific senses, this is the this is the case, constitute the sum and substance of this chapter, which advocates a move away from a narrow engineering construction perspective towards a more multidisciplinary understanding of water with central emphasis on the goal of resilient ecosystems, a focus on the principle of subsidiarity, incentivization of participatory approaches, modern data management system, innovations in technology, and path-breaking legal changes that recognize the common pool nature of water and are based on the most updated scientific knowledge. So I think that this particular article that he has given us is so well, it's about 40 pages of type pages with all the rendition diagrams and so on. It was very revealing in terms of the new dimension that we need to worry about. And he is bringing to bear these wisdom, words of wisdom uh, into the job that currently he is doing, even as he did many things in the UPA two-time regime also. I go to the next one, which is the machine intelligence and its relevance to India, Professor Vidya Sagar. Machine intelligence refers to the use of a computing machine to perform tasks that are relatively easy for the human being. I don't think I need to emphasize anything further to this audience, but difficult for a computer designed to perform arithmetic operations. Machine intelligence includes broad range of topics, um, the topics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, pattern recognition and so on. Today, computer can perform arithmetic operations roughly 10 raised to 12 times, um, even it would have gone further up now, uh, than the human beings, the teraflop rate and find it difficult to perform tasks that humans perform routinely. Recognize handwriting, pick out face from a, a photograph, remembering a melody. According to the author, today's success in machine intelligence has not come solely because of raw computing power, but through an important computing factor, introduction of new mathematical paradigm consisting of problem formulations and solution methodologies. Recent developments in advances in pattern recognition, such as multi-layer perception networks, need to achieve desirable behavior to train the network by adjusting the various parameters of the network by the use of backpropagation algorithms. I don't think that I should get into the details of the business. These are all, the, for example, the multi-layer perception network itself was damned as something which is not going to work. But to bring in, to train them and then to create this kind of a network by the use of back propulsion algorithm from several spaces is something that has completely changed the concept of a machine intelligence today. The second development relates to support vector machines that overcome the limitation of linear separ separability and this was another kind of a problem uh, which of course uh, was uh, met successfully in terms of finding a solution. The third development is deep learning where is the, the, the uh, multi-layer perception networks limitations due to the insufficient training samples are overcome with big data and the realization of multi-core processors are in. So this is one of the key developments recent, recently happened and it is owing to the fact that we talk about the big data analytics and also the availability of multi-core uh, processors. So this is just to summarize the type of thing that uh, Dr. Professor Vidyathagar highlights in the area of machine intelligence. 
which he can take back into what we can do in India. That is, that, these are the rationale on which the previous statements have been made. The author suggests two different levels to further the advances in machine intelligence that could be of interest to India. First, back office to the world role that India plays in other sectors of ID. You know about these back offices, services that India has been giving so far. The vast majority of people who use machine intelligence are practitioners and not researchers. No incentive to industries to pay fancy salary for machine intelligence experts if available in India at fraction of a price. The idea of deep learning is right for India to make its mark. So he thinks we can have an analog, an analog of a back office to the world, uh, even in machine intelligence, uh, but providing a kind of a service uh, level, a practitioner role, and not doing the research part of it, which can be taken up. But even for the research, he comes in the second suggestion, India can play a significant role in plugging some theoretical gaps in the current machine learning theory. Development of such theory would immediately place the developer at the research front. This needs, besides knowledge of machine learning, techniques, also knowledge in statistical learning theory and other traditional aspect of machine learning. But what is interesting, he makes the final observation, student overseas increasingly reluctant to learn requisite background of mathematics. Indian students with their traditional aptitude for mathematics can easily undertake such research leading India to a preeminent position in machine learning. So I think the message is very clear. India has a great future in this area and you need not be very much worried about the job losses because of the current IT related practices. And he has given some very strong reason why it can be so. And in fact, encouraged by this, we in Karnataka already has a small group which is working into improving the education practice as well as bringing it along with the industries. So this is one of the outcomes which has already happened after reading the type of and the type of discussion we had with uh, Professor Vidya Sagar. On the deep ocean technology, even though oceans are about 72% of the surface of our planet, only 5% is explored till now. They also account for more than 95% of the biosphere. The seas around India have abundant living and non-living sources in the exclusive economic zone and in the deep seas which lie unexplored. India has 1.3 trillion cubic meter of natural gas reserves in the form of solidified methane. Even 10% recovery of this large reserve can meet the energy requirement of India for the next 100 years. It has been estimated that 380 million metric tons of polymetallic nodules are available at the bottom of the sea. So you can see the type of resources that are lying hidden in the ocean. Deep sea technologies are primarily to address the exploration and the exploitation of the rich resource of living and non-living sources. As a first step towards harvesting these skull modules, a sea crawler based on mining uh, machine was developed and demonstrated at a water depth of 500 meters. This is just the beginning of what India started developing as a deep ocean technology. Based on the experience in mining machine, now they are developing a 6,000 meter water depth uh, a, a, a mining machine. A deep water work closely or uh, work class, water work class, Remotely operated vehicle was developed to aid the exploration of deep sea ocean minerals used for exploring up to a maximum of 5,200 meters. A shallow water ROV, the re again remotely operated vehicle, rated at 500 meters with scientific payloads can be used for exploiting the lakes and also to examine the health of the coral, re coral reefs in Andaman Islands and maybe Lakshadweep Islands. So these are some of the things on which the work has been started. These technologies will continue to evolve and more sophisticated and capable versions will be developed in the future. Deep ocean research is truly interdisciplinary and the technology required for observing, understanding and harvesting the oceanic resources is vast. Oceanographers, engineers, climate scientists, physicists, biologists, geologists, geophysicists, meteorologists and chemists they are all the, and nuclear scientists are a few of the stakeholders. So you can see the diverse areas which are brought under what you call as a ocean, deep ocean research. And uh, ocean related research and development in the country is in the process of taking. I should say this is where the present government has given a new direction. I understand that just like we some 50, 60 years back, we went up into the space and tried to master the space with uh, launch vehicles and satellites and so on. 
the present prime minister feels that we should now go deeper on the other side and we india should become a leader in this area of exploration and uh, he is now trying to give enough support for this activity not only for the department but also to several other institution so i think the present department the, the department of ocean development certainly is going to take advantage of this and they are also now coming with uh, programs where they will work with other national agencies and create national missions department of and also with international collaboration these approaches according to the others is expected to lead india's ocean research and exploration capabilities to the levels of global standard at this particular stage i think this is a priority area and we are quite lagging behind many of the other countries working in this particular subject modernizing this is the last one that i would like to say this is a this is one of the things uh, which i told you that was written in place of vaccines the others have presented a very innovative approach to the 21st century healthcare system in india unique ways of integrating the traditional indian medicinal medicinal systems with modern allopathic approaches has been elucidated the ideas presented in this chapter are original and approaches are pragmatic some key observations in this connection by the others include one Indian traditional systems of medicine flow in two streams, an oral one and a codified stream. The oral stream comprises diverse ecosystem and ethnic community specific traditions of healthcare. The oral stream possesses empirical knowledge derived from keen natural observations and simple inferences. The codified traditions of healthcare are referred to by several etymological names the rich names like ayurveda yoga siddha sourigba or unani sharing a common ground by way of principles concepts therapies resources and particularly the materia medica modernity results from evolving traditions knowledge exchanges across cultures remains a progressive feature of the civilizational process and while every culture may modernize from its own roots it must also open to learn from other cultures and it's quite obvious why this message is being given by the authors innovation are underway to fill in some of the critical medical gaps of modern healthcare spectacular advances in biomedical and pharmaceutical sciences are taking place all these developments alongside with the dissemination platforms created by the information technology are expected to gradually influence the healthcare so particularly at tertiary care level india is perhaps the only country in the world that is advantage of seven recognized systems of healthcare at its disposal india has over 700000 ayush doctors ayush doctors have special knowledge about the nutrition and lifestyle along with time tested herbal medicines both for common and chronic diseases if mainstreaming of ayush happens in healthcare the present doctor to patient ratio of 1 is to 1600 will be improved to 1 is to 700 and the cost of healthcare might be brought down considerably integrative healthcare emerging paradigm for the 21st century the futuristic visualization of these scientists is that the approach of modern medicine which starts at molecular level and progresses towards building system of course now you call this as the systems biology and the traditional medicines holistic approaches will intersect fruitfully if expertise and research are managed carefully integrative health sciences is therefore seen as the new transdisciplinary framework for innovative biological solutions that can impact life sciences and medicine and that is crazily what the research in the bangalore center of the transdisciplinary university is going on emerging innovative approaches include are you genomics and personalized medicine which is the study of genomic variation analysis and gene expression for profiling of human dosha prakriti and reverse pharmacology in which the drug discovery is based on the researches ayurveda knowledge to start from time tested and safe botanical material very interesting finally the others conclude the following the health policy framework for the 21st century thus needs to make a bold shift from the biomedicine driven hospital based institutionally driven curative healthcare to new directions which focus on disease prevention wellness science and community empowerment 
The complexity lies in translation of the policy into regulation, health administration, medical education, research, public health, creation of wellness establishments and community empowerment. Of course, the most important medical research councils will similarly need to be changed. One very important innovation that is possible in the new integrative healthcare strategy, that's what they call it as integrative healthcare strategy, is to revitalize the age-old traditions of home health care through simple ecosystem-specific herbal remedies and non-drug therapies. Recognition of the need for community empowerment and designing a strategy for the same can usher in the modalities of a fourth in fourth system. This is what the interesting aspect is. Fourth non-institutional community and home-based tire. This is the fourth tire as he calls it in the national health system. The tire when established can probably take care of about 40 to 50 percent of family health expenditure on primary health care. This fourth tire will be an innovation in the design of the national health system that can be of relevance to all the countries around the world. The extremely interesting and innovative out-of-box thinking they have given. I conclude this lecture of course Without uh, saying a few words about space, I don't want to conclude it, having been associated with more than half my life in the science area. India space science, of course, have a very vast outreach. I want, I'm not talking about the description of the space prior activity, but if you really look at the influence that has made with regard to the various activities and national endeavors, you can see very clearly there are the socio-economic endeavors, there are commercial activities, strategic sectors, in all of them, uh, space has its presence today. And the linkages between many of those grand challenges and the space activity is becoming more and more strong. And so this is one example of an overarching system like a space capability, it could be an atomic energy capability in some areas, but these can have an influence far beyond the restricted way we understand these kind of activities in this country. And India has really shown the way in trying to bring out the highlight, the importance of the space with respect to many, many other national endeavors. And uh, that, of course, is something that we may like to bring a limited, to a limited extent in our write-up, where the India Space Program and the proposed grand challenges, how they connect themselves and how they have the potential of even strengthening and expanding in the future. So with these few words, I would like to thank all of you for your attention and thank you. While listening to Dr. K. Kasturi Rangan, I had forgotten that I may have to make a remark. So while I ready myself for making any appreciative remarks about that, uh, I just want to thank him. And also I want to welcome uh, Mrs. Malati Ramana, who has joined us already. And we are always honored with her presence and her presence gives a very special meaning to this evening whenever we have Dr. Rajaramana Memorial Lecture. Uh, this uh, is open for discussions, first by the participants and then by anybody else who would like to have. Uh, uh, it was a very interesting uh, uh, talk uh, and about that your kind of challenges which you have focused here is something the last part is, is where we are belonging a little bit our area's interest also overlaps so what uh, just i was wondering about that that in our traditional ayus and ayurvedic system we have a many much much more strength and efficacy what the knowledge is and if it is really comes into the effects to the society but uh, more challenge is to validate those the claim which is made to be authentic. So do you have any kind of uh, uh, quality check on that part of that final modernizing of Ayurvedic? That's my only. See, some, some research, they have actually the efficacy part of it and the scientific basis for it is one aspect of it on which there is some research that's now going on for the last few years. In fact, you're in more than a decade. The CSIR has set up a institutional thing with multidisciplinary thing. The standard university, for example, is doing precisely the research on that kind of a thing, where you have the, the most important thing that one should recognize is there is a kind of a clinical data that is available on the Ayurvedic system of medicine, 
which is not available in any other kind of a system because this runs into thousands of years and if you really look at all the literature which is also there it is, an, it is quite revealing that there is so much deep into this uh, people have gone and written about it. Now that is being looked up, that is being tried to see whether it can, we can add it in the context of the modern understanding. For example, even the bus mass, the bus mass and the nanotechnology that one is talking of. Now they find that there is a meaning and that is why bus mass in, in a certain size of these particles, it works in the body, but it can also be deleterious to the health if you do it in some other sizes. So, these kind of understanding of what it is. But right now, the mit much of the data that is available and the outcome of the data in terms of the actual uh, visible improvements of the person undergoing that kind of a treatment is the best. Right now, it is, that is the only way to say this. But because of the sheer numbers, you can say a big data analytics is applicable to this kind of a thing. I think there is trust in the system. So. But if you really go into, I have talked to Ayurvedic physicians on this, even though I myself don't, I don't know much about this, but he said that there, there are constituents in this, which in the normal circumstances, you would like to touch it, but they are all there, and they are all part of a code which has been written down, and on which the, video, the evaluation has been done through the actual field trials. So it's right now it's a question of the trial one, trial two, trial two, those four levels. Something akin to that is uh, done here, and there, there is a data there on that part. But we need to, that, that doesn't say that we need to o o overlook the possibility of doing research in this area, where you try to bring in more and more science into the Ayurvedic system. And that is right now the agenda. In fact, the uh, yoga has been one of the things on which you no know, people have been able to take it up. And I think, again, there is now only I have seen some good papers on the yoga very, very, very uh, scientific papers written in erudite journals in medicine and uh, which very clearly bring, and they use the latest of the instruments uh, for make measurements. Those instruments were not there at that time. And but some of the theories that you assume will be applicable, they are able to validate it now. And some very nice papers are there. I went to the Ayurvedic University in Bangalore. Uh, they are doing quite a bit of research, but most of them look like a, a regular good research laboratory. So that is the future for this kind of work. But it's very important that we should continue that. I may add a little, Professor Valetan, who is one of our most distinguished medical doctor and a scientist, he over 10 years has inspired many young researchers from very good institutes and they are published in high impact journals and they are spending very systematic efforts and approaches for the traditional medical system. So I think the steps are there and they would connect up and all. So some of the finest researchers have to choose this as a fertile mm -hmm. and a front end. Then things would happen. In books, uh, just to continue, I'm sorry. Uh, the, both the Charaka and Sushruda, the treatises that he has written is tremendous. And most recently he has done for, for your uh, along with your bag, travel bag, you want to have a book to learn Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. He has written a book for that. And uh, that has just been published. And there is a review of that in the current science, the latest current science. And he came to this forum and his, uh, uh, the text of his lecture is available on our website. So it oh, will supplement great. what you have heard and read uh, Professor Valetan's uh, uh, sort of richness of the system and how the modern society can be made to accept it on its own terms. That is also very important. Uh, continuing the same traditional medicine uh, topic, uh, that is we have two uh, modes. One is where it is codified and other one which is oral. How do we, because this oral thing is, you know, which where in tribal uh, medicine mm -hmm. also it is there. Mm -hmm. How do we plan to um, recover <coughs> this before it gets extinct? It's a good question. I can only say, uh, Professor Darshan Sangar, for example, wanted to run a project uh, in one of the districts of Karnataka on pharmacopoeia and uh, took at the traditional knowledge by going to the ground and interviewing the people there. And they have been still using the traditional methods of uh, treating themselves and uh, try to create a kind of a database around it. I think like many other floor floors and other kinds of folk, uh, folk and uh, other traditional activities, 
all these need to be properly uh, documented by actual field visits, discussions with them, and you need a set of people who understand also what is to be looked for and what kind of recommendation. I think we are falling short of that, certainly. And this is true of everything. Even if you talk of folk songs, folklores, everywhere we have this problem of whether how, how well are we documented these things. So it's an area which is open, but I think that the scientific community, they are doing that. But we need, I think, a coming together of the social scientists, um, medicine, people from medicine, and also the regular scientists. And we need to create an institutional mechanism for doing this. Right now, neither there is a recognition of this in that seriousness, nor there is a support for this. Because unless there is a recognition, there is, cannot be a support. Sir. Actually, even after 70 years of uh, independence in India, still we have been facing a lot of problems in terms of micronutrient malnutrition. And the <coughs> iron, actually, we are standing in rank number two. No. While production of green leafy vegetables, vegetables and fruits next to China, sir. But there is a short gap between the consumers and the producers. How we will meet and how we will uh, address this gap particularly to eradicate this malnutrition problem, sir? Oh, so a very difficult question. I think many people have tried to answer it, but I don't think it was ever satisfied. Uh, satisfied. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, yesterday, somebody was sitting near me in a table, dining table, and he said that if we take out money at the rate of something like 100 rupees per day, some money he's quoted, and you uniformly distribute it. Don't don't worry whether uh, it is the person is a Tata or he has a money and he has got money. But so don't stop that, but give uniformly for 365 days and say that this is for the malnutrition related money which is they have cal calculated that money is good enough for giving the minimum nutrition for every Indian. It works out to be about 3% per percent of the GDP, the present GDP. So if 3% of the present GDP can take care of the non-nutrition across the spectrum of the society of India, there is a solution obviously. It is a question of not the production. It is not the question of non-availability, but it is a question of distribution, affordability, and both these questions, food distribution and availability, and a good awareness that this should be a part of this to a major segment of the population who are not necessarily educated. I think it is a major campaign to be started. But I think these are things on which governmental interference can, in, 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 getting into the governmental level of solution has its own uh, limitation. If you ask me, it should be made into a kind of a movement, local, regional and national. So these are all movements to be brought in. So that means every citizen has to recognize his other person. If he is having a problem of non-nutrition, that's something he should do to help him. That kind of an awareness and that kind of an, you know, be helpful. Uh, some of that kind of an attitude, the culture, so the culture and the movement probably is the one to deal with. We are not dealing with 100,000 people or 200,000 people. We are dealing with 50, 60 crores kind of numbers. And these are not easy. This is all of Europe, uh, twice the number is what we are trying to solve the problem here. And so I don't think there is a very clear-cut solution to this. So right from number solutions which people give to a social solution to this, to me it should be socially the one that is workable. And it has to be on a moment basis, not so much on, on a policy basis. And one has to make sure that even as a movement, it should be a culture among Indians. That you, you, if you see somebody and not, not under, underfed or something, we should do something for him. That kind of an attitude should come. And that's only, at least to me, after having heard in the last 30, 40 years, solutions from different quarters. And even yesterday, a young boy telling that if we distribute 100 rupees <laughs> to every Indian, and don't worry about whether he's the richest man or he's the poorest man. We will do that and we'll, then later on from tax, the richer man will pay more. The poorer fellow won't pay. But we let it not make it even distinction there. He thinks that 3% of the GDP is what is needed. And that will remove the uh, uh, malnutrition. That is the solution he gave. I thought there is no flaw in it. And apparently they consulted some economist also. From economist point of view, it looks okay because he relates only to the GDP number. That 3% also is okay. I'm just telling, uh, I mean, how silly it is, I don't know. So, so you asked questions about, uh, from participants, then we'd invite questions from our invitees. <laughs>
you have mentioned about engineering education as uh, one of the topics. Even Mr. Narayan Murthy was critical about our education system. Can you just highlight what are the points? Uh, in yeah, I think I think in the engineering education, what Pro Professor Pradeep Datta has uh, tried to highlight is first of all, uh, the there is a large number of people coming out of the educational institutions, but they are not oriented towards uh, jobs. This is one aspect of it which he has analyzed with respect to the type of training, the type of pedagogy and the type of learning they get and how much it is. This is one aspect of it. The second is with respect to uh, the teachers. There, there are serious paucity of uh, the competent teachers and uh, you know the, the private systems and the public systems, every system has got its own deficiencies in terms of the quality of teaching. This is the third, second part. The third is if you really look at the regulation and many other kinds of procedures that are laid there in order to improve the quality of the education, is much the, the less the less the said, the better it is. That is a kind of a thing. Then, more recently, even beyond this, I most probably will revise this. The question of what do you treat as an engineering education? I just read an uh, interesting article that India produces a large number of engineers, but they don't produce innovators. Why is it? So there's a kind of a question. If you really look at it, the problem is to transform an engineer into an innovator. The example, example was given about the Macintosh. Uh, Steve Jobs said how did Macintosh com computer became a kind of a thing. Macintosh became one of the things that is appealing to everybody in terms of its architecture, in terms of its structure and its uh, ethics, uh, what do you call as the nice uh, way in which it is created. Then the, what, what Steve Jobs said is, it, they, no doubt they are the best of the computer science, uh, computer engineers in the world that they employ for Macintosh. But they are also the people who had a value for aesthetics. They, some of them were good musicians, some of them were good architects, some of them were uh, good, uh, uh, you know, anything which has got an aesthetic, arts and crafts. They were all there. So that mind that worked on this kind of a device is a mind which was more than engineering. It, it also had this kind of additional attributes. So he feels unless our educational system is also integrating areas like liberal arts and uh, other kinds of areas where you bring in additional knowledge which adds further to the ideas of thinking and Im improving the product. I think the, we will con continue to be the good engineers, we, so we can design something, but how do you take it to the market and how a successful product comes into it? There is still a gap. I mean, you give this example, want to give the type of gaps that exist in the system. This is another kind of a thing. So, these are some of the points that is, uh, that is brought there, but the fact remains that if you really look at the number of en the engineers that is needed for a particular job, particular area, we don't have the right numbers. And there is one fundamental gap in the knowledge of planning, and that is we don't have like the in, um, American, the National Academy of Engineering, where they make, you know, that uh, they came out with a very beautiful report on the number of engineers needed in various areas. We don't have the corresponding value. We try to talk to FIKI, I try to talk to CII, but in spite of all that, we don't have authentic numbers of the base on what is the planning for education. This is, the, this is another type of problem that we have. And then we also look at the, the, the questions of education vis-a-vis -vis the requirements in the country, even where it is obvious, uh, we find that we don't plan it properly. You do just look at the number of reactors that are coming up into the country and if you're going to develop a 60 GV kind of a power in the 2030, 2040, uh, the number of engineers, you nuclear, nuclear engineers that you need and the type of quality that need to have Today, most of the institutions in the country, they don't, I mean, you may like to say this, uh, even including IITs, don't have a department of nuclear engineering, the only one which had was the correct poor, and they closed it down. So, on one side, you are going to have enormous investments in an area, and we are not prepared with the human resource for that. So, there is a gap in this kind of way. And so, what happens? ISRO starts a training center, atomic energy starts a training center, you know, this is all because you make up, but these are all short-term technical fixes. This is not a long-term kind of a thing. So you need to have a much better planning, much better data resource, data informa information systems, be much better in terms of inputs from the users, in both in industries and government departments. So the, in all these things, we need to streamline. 
this part of it is also another area which we need to look at. I mean, I'd go to some of the invitees. Namaste, Kasturi Rangan sir, respected Kasturi Nanda sir, and uh, Baldev Raj sir. The question is for both of you. Uh, you talked about four themes and a great mission for India. I wanted to know from your personal perspective, would you reflect on the great traditions of India like Vedic sciences and Upanishads, where there is a base of knowledge, creative excellence and innovation, uh, deep insight, giving the models and different ideas for the new innovations. Uh, our university is already into the research of this kind and would you, would you take a pause to reflect whether you can include those ideas into your mission and vision for the country because I'm working on brain sciences uh, and how we enhance the creative cognition amongst the youth. Uh, I'm from Svyasa, working with Dr. Nagendra and my PhD guide is here, Dr. Alex from Cambridge. If we give you some ideas, uh, so that you can formulate some vision for the young India. Would you be interested, sir? Certainly. I, I Before I request, uh, Baldev also will have his views on this. I want to tell you one thing. Now, we are really trying to look at from the education point of view. Uh, for example, I'll start with the preschool education. The pre present preschool education is the one in which you try to cheat the child. You go to, you send the child. In many cases, the pride that the parent takes is because of the fact that the child is able to say what he is supposed to say in the first standard in the preschool itself. That is not the preschool education. You know, you since you come from, I am saying this only because you come from the brain research group, there is a cognitive science and that cognitive science and the ability to uh, see and understand grows through the first thousand years, the first thousand days of the child's growth. During that time, you need to provide those kind of input to the child which is maximally resonates with the growth of the brain. That research has not been done. In fact, one of the things that we want to do right now to discuss is to look at what, how do we reorient the preschool education because the brain uh, uh, the growth, almost 90% is over. And at that time, you are not really addressing the question of teaching something there, which will go maximally, we can make a make you. So, this is one thing which we have so the, uh, right at the preschool education to a part of the primary school education, we need to restructure. This is, this, 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 for which we need a lot of research. Because we should understand every element of what we try to do in terms of inputs, pedagogy, and also the learning or learnings outcome. All the three elements we should have to evaluate. Today, if you want to have teachers for that, you don't have the teachers. It, it so happens you need the most capable teachers, analytical teachers, for preschool education rather than for IITs. That is the kind of a challenge that you are going to throw for the and how the number of children that we are going to deal with in this is a mind boggling. So this is the first part of it. The, the second part of it is the question of trying to reduce the overall uh, learning uh, for the rest of the school education. There is always this question of carrying the burden of what, what uh, learning, learning and whether we are overfeeding the children with knowledge which is not needed for that. We are looking into the question of 50% is what you need as a regular education. 50% has to be based on the value-based education. And the value-based education will contain, contain everything that you are talking of. And that we are trying to see what kind of a structure we need for that. We have consulted quite a lot of people in this particular area. Certainly you are welcome and we could certainly uh, consult you. And lastly, the question of higher education. Uh, there, there was a very interesting talk we not normally we, we just heard recently we had a discussion at the International Center for Theoretical Studies here in Bangalore and uh, we had uh, dad, uh, what is that dad that French professor was there who gave a very nice talk about the various traditions of India and how those traditions of India today can be integrated into higher education also and he had a very clear cut direction for that so there is another case. so we have today the input from all this Research is, of course, there is a gap in the research knowledge that we need to certainly go fill. And when you even when you talk of research knowledge, you should know that you also have to assume that there will be corresponding teachers who will pick it up and then teach it. That is another bigger challenge that we have. But they, so there is a multiplicity of these areas to be connected up and to create an educational system, which in, in, a, in a sense it could be 
different from what we are accustomed to. And uh, so that is where your question becomes applicable in terms of how do you bring in the ancient uh, traditions and ancient knowledge, how do we bring it? There is a lot of sense in the ancient system, that there is no doubt on that. Well, uh, Professor Kasarindu and uh, Professor Baldev Raj, of course, now you just touched on the higher education uh, arena. And uh, since I am closely associated with that for the last uh, few years now, as a rector of the set of institutions, I would like to bring to your notice, uh, specifically it is noticed that the, the three arms or the three axes into which the knowledge transfer takes place, not the, not the probably the usual pedagogy, which is required actually for the 21st century, the content, uh, the delivery, and the knowledge generation. They are not harmoniously linked in any of the courses I have come across. It is actually an extension of the previous one, deletion of something which is added. So the quality is at stake. Things may produce with good results again and again. That res the result does not produce actually the, the intent what we have. So this gap needs to be addressed by all the intellectuals, the content, uh, the delivery, and the knowledge generation. Knowledge generation definitely goes to the research. That's why, look at this environment itself. No product or process which has fundamentally invented or discovered here, or which has made what you use, innovated. So it's not actually not including this. So why is it so? In 21st century, if we want to pave the way or want to do the seeding, we have to look at the fundamental process with which Harvard or MIT looked into in transforming the community what they have got inside and put them outside with a complete change. So the content, delivery, and knowledge generation, we have to segregate it and we have to emphatically put a large scale force into all the educational institutions to align with that rather than following some of the accreditation schemes. Even though I'm supporting, I was associated with the ABET board in US, but I'm telling the same repeat process may not help us. We have to do then only a breakaway success we will have and we will be fit and fine after 50 years in 21st century. Thank you. What so course you would like to respond to it? No, I, I, I think the, the statements that you made are very well, because they are facts. I don't think I can contest on that part of it. The point that you want to raise is why, why it doesn't happen. <coughs> so we have asked several, this thing, everybody, if you give to 10 Indians, uh, we are well-informed people, why this doesn't happen? They have till different, 10 different answers. The perception changes. That also shows, in a sense, the complexity of the issue. It is not so much of their ignorance, but the complexity of the issue. I personally feel we are now trying to take stock of this whole thing. And uh, the only solution that right now it is there is to start good, good institutions with certain level of rigor with respect to maintaining the standards. The standard themselves are set by the best of the research so that the pedagogy and everything, there is no doubt on that. You should get the best of the teachers. You look at just now the Ashoka University has started. It's been gaining its own name. But if you look at who is who there, then you know why it is gaining the name. So I think if you try to correlate like this, you have all the answers and you have also the institutions. But the question is how do you connect them? So I, it is an issue which is much more than just a policy. Thank you very much. Uh, I will bring it to the I think so. uh, Professor Kasturi Rangan, uh, you started with uh, giving an example of your association with Dr. Raja Ramana. And it brings out clearly that why we consider Dr. Raja Ramana as a leader in science and in many walks of life and why we consider him as a complete scientist and a leader. You also brought out the importance of detailing and still having a wide spectrum knowledge so that you can discuss right from philosophy, music, architect to any branch of science or a national problem. It was very revealing for the participants which we have because they are the future leaders and they must understand rather than saying that why they are not getting recognition which according to them they deserve 
they should look at what elements the leadership are made of and what do they do. And I feel all of you have the capability to go to those leadership if you really make efforts. I'm also grateful that I had the opportunity of once again associating with you on this book, Grand Challenges, which according to me is a paradigm change. And I think this is very important contribution by you. Though we are associated with you, it is your wisdom, your way of looking at it, your choice of authors. We all help with our little knowledge. But this book really reflects your mind. It's a mind of Dr. Kasuri Rangan, which is finally the book. I'm sure that you would all be looking forward when this book is out and you would like to read it and take it to your organizations. And all the topics which you chose, it is not very easy because you have picked the best experts and you have highlighted, underlined, and brought your own wisdom to say what these chapters mean. And in all the areas, I think India has to become conscious that we have traditional strengths in our Vedic science, in our ways of well-being of the planet, which the world has no clue about that. <coughs> Believe me, when you go all over the world, it is much appreciated. But we must get a confidence of our own to be able to connect it, to validate it, and present it in the ways in where today we do the science. We are traditionally strong in mathematics, in our wisdom, in our concepts of sustainability, in our concepts of equity, in our concepts of governance, right from the periods of Mahanjodhara, Harappa, Nalanda University, and all that. I think we have to somehow in a short window of opportunity bring all these together because time is the essence, vector is the essence, pace is the essence. So all these we have to do and that is where your lecture this evening uh, has really given us the motivation, the energy, the thoughts to think and become a part of the movement. Somewhere along the line you use the word movement, I believe <coughs> Always looking up to the policies and the organization is not helpful. Whatever success story you see in space and atomic energy, white revolution, green revolution, Gandhian movement, the greatest of the movements, the Gandhian movement, they were all inspired by the leaders and followed with total faith and commitment and not creating many ideas. Creating many ideas is good, but after creating many ideas, you have to converge with the leader to be able to do something substantial. Otherwise, you are creating scatter. You are not creating signal. We have to create a signal and the impact of that. So, Professor Kasturi Rangan, we are delighted. You have agreed to give Professor Raja Ramana Memorial Lecture. This very important day for us and your presence and acceptance has made all the difference. Our gratitude to you. Thank you, Professor Kasturi Rangan and Professor Baldev Raj. Uh, now I would request Mrs. Uh, Malti Ramanna and uh, Dr. Baldev Raj to join in giving uh, the speaker certificate to Dr. Kasturi Rangan. Thank you, Mrs. Malti Ramanna, Dr. Baldev Raj, and Dr. Gasturi Rangan. I now request uh, Mr. T. V. Prabhu from Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research to present vote of thanks. Our respected, distinguished speaker, Professor K. Kasturi Rangan, formerly Chief ISRO, Professor Dr. Baldev Raj, my ex-director at IGCAR, currently Director NIAS, Distinguished audience present here for the 13th Raja Ramana Memorial Lecture, participants of the 15th NIAS DST training program. A very good evening to everyone present here. On behalf of the participants of this workshop, I deem it as a great honor and privilege to stand before you to deliver the vote of thanks. It's obviously a lifetime cherishable opportunity to listen to an eminent space scientist lecture elaborating the great grand challenges for India. 
the grand challenges presented here will definitely energize youngsters, develop a sense of responsibility, commitment, and make us think that we should play a larger role in this process. I am certain, sir, India will achieve these challenges. We have enjoyed listening to your thought-provoking lecture, sir. On behalf of the participants, my heartfelt gratitude and thanks to the exciting lecture, sir. Thanks for being with us and making it a special occasion in our life. We are equally grateful to the NIAS management for making such an intellectual ambience and making such a memorable event happen. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.